Howdy folks, this is Dan Gross and welcome to Extended Harmony for Outside End Music. Outside End Music is a record label and a media company that connects jazz artists with their passionate fan bases. Please visit us at our website, outsideendmusic.com, where you can see our artists and their recent releases, our podcasts, video interviews, and links to get in touch with us. Extended Harmony, what you're listening to right now, is a monthly podcast that features musicians in the jazz, blues, and soul umbrella who create original music. We discuss their lives, influences, and any advice they'd like to pass along. Joining us today is Reed Wizard, composer and arranger Charles Pillow, based in New York, and an assistant professor at the Eastman School of Music. Yes, we're doing another Eastman show. Charles plays the sax, many varieties of flute and oboe. We're going to talk to him today about his early life and influences, his time at Eastman as a student and then becoming a professor at Eastman, his read technique, his future projects, mainly what he's going on, this awesome Miles Davis, I don't want to say tribute CD, but it's a Miles Davis inspired CD, and of course, any advice he'd like to pass along. Thanks so much for tuning in, and please enjoy this episode of Extended Harmony. Charles, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Thanks for having me. So, let's start out nice and easy. Where are you from, Charles? I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yeah, and uh, you ha- you took a bit of a... You decided that all that warm weather wasn't enough for you, and you eventually made your way to Rochester, but we'll get, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, growing up in that area, what were some of your early musical influences, and when did you start playing music? I started playing music... Uh like most kids do around fourth or fifth grade mm-hmm. i started on the drums and then uh uh i switched to saxophone i think in the sixth or seventh grade mm-hmm. and i was fortunate enough to have a junior high school which is what they called them down there mm-hmm. uh band director who was a saxophone player and turned me on to a paul desmond record mm. um and uh then when i went to the high school we had a very uh well-known educator in Louisiana named Lee Forche, who mm. had been on the road with Woody Herman's band, which was quite a wow. quite a thing back in those days. And so he he ran a really great program, and we would go to New Orleans for festivals and concerts and stuff. And we actually our band sort of competed against the Marcellus Brothers when we were you know all kind of coming up. So okay, <laughs> uh, it was a very healthy situation. Oh. Yeah, very healthy situation. So I'm very lucky. What drew you to playing jazz? Was it was there anything in particular that that grabbed you and hooked you in? Uh, that's a good question. You know, um, that's a very good question. I'm not sure. You know, hearing Paul Desmond and Dave mm-hmm. Brubeck, um, yeah, was just you know, <laughs> and it just seemed like the thing to do. Uh, like mm-hmm. I said, the the um, in the environment of the two educators that were so prominent down there uh it just it just made it like hey this is this is what i want to do and you know after you hear remember hearing charlie parker and john coltrane and then that just that just cemented it right there you yeah know? that that does it for most so, people just, we just... <laughs> we found charlie parker <laughs> charlie parker has a special place in pretty much everyone's heart so as we alluded to not a couple minutes ago um you decided to do things in the opposite direction and decided that you were living in this really warm place and you wanted to go someplace really cold. And you found your... Well, Rochester is also very hot, but you know, it's <laughs> all over the place. But you decided, hey, I want to experience some snow. So tell us how you got to the Eastman School of Music. Well, after high school, I went to college in, in New Orleans, which mm-hmm. was sort of the place to, to go for um, jazz improvisation, mm. and that type of music. Um, Loyola University had a good program and the two or three, they kind of came and went, uh, saxophone teachers that I had, had just finished their master's degrees at Eastman. Mm. So it just made sense to try to go to Eastman. I didn't care what the weather was. I just knew that, (laughs) you know, I I had to be there, you know? And that was that was just another lucky thing, you know. You have these these folks that that are coming from such a good place, and they it just makes sense to end up going there. And then, of course, I, I did my master's degree at Eastman and got to study with Ray Wright, mm. Ray Ricker, and Bill Dobbins. You know, Ooh. so 
that's that's what got me there forget rock and roll that's a power trio right there <laughs> um, <laughs> so i i wanted to uh th- this is probably, um, we'll figure out the chronology right now. One of the things that makes what you do very unique is uh, almost every reed player now doubles. Uh, there are more and more who have oboe in the repertoire as well. But it's not just that you play flute, it's that you play many varieties of flute. And so I wanted to talk to you today about not just doubling as a reed player in general, but how you came to double on you know, uh, bass flute or alto flute and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, you know, I get, <clears throat> excuse me, I get that question a lot, you know, as far as saxophone players having to double. And uh, it's it's sort of a commercial necessity. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, if you're going to going to work, you know, and, 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 and even in very, very creative uh, ensembles, um, clarinet and flute players and saxophone players a lot of times uh, are playing um, many instruments, you know, mm-hmm. so it's not just, um, you know, recording for, um, you know, sort of commercial recordings where mm-hmm. <clears throat> you're required to do a lot of doubling. But I, I always tell my students that um, I, I look at it, I look at it this way, where if you're a saxophone player studying saxophone and you want to play flute, you're going to have to listen to some great flute players mm-hmm. to hear what the instrument should sound like. And when you do that, you're going to hear music that you may not have heard as a saxophone player, mm. whether it's a, you know, Mozart clarinet concerto or some Baroque flute or, you know, contemporary oboe or Hindemith oboe sonata. So that music may have gotten past you had you not been, interested in those other instruments. And what I find happens is that um, I I call it like a cross pollinization Hmm. um, where you start, I think you start to become, you know, your ears are open a little little bit more Mm -hmm. and it, it helps you compositionally helps you write music that might be different than you would have written for saxophone. So if you're going to write a tune for flute or write a tune for oboe, to play in a jazz improvisation context. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be different than if you wrote for a saxophone. So then right. here's, here's the thing that I really like. So if you write a tune for oboe, which I've done, mm-hmm. you know, many times when you play it on oboe, you're going to play it differently than you played on saxophone. If you then play it on saxophone, your saxophone playing is going to change because the chords are something that probably are, different from what you've done before it's not going to be bebop based at all it's going to be something something else mm-hmm. um so that's what, that's what i mean by cross pollinization it's like the the doubles start to reflect back on your saxophone playing right and it, and when it's all said and done it should be sort of one voice where mm. you're playing different instruments but you're sort of expressing the same thing with i call it like a broader tonal palette mm-hmm. sort of an orchestral tonal palette so you know, a group of five musicians, if the saxophone player is playing different instruments, you know, each tune can have a different scope, you know, so I, I really like that. And I, I, I tell my students, you know, use the, use the doubles for good, not for evil, you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. like, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes part of your voice and it becomes something you express and not, not just a way to make more money. Right. You know? And something you were talking about. Or to be hireable. Right. And you were talking about how uh, the mirror always reflects back at you different ways when you're playing different instruments. And I I just thought of this analogy. It's like you're in a haunted house and you're in the room of mirrors and you can't quite tell which one is reflecting back at you, which one is the real you. But yet the real you is in the center and you got to navigate through all that. I wanted to circle back around to the the Eastman thing. Uh, Not... Everyone I've talked to has had the opportunity to both be a student at some place and then go back and then be a professor at that place. So the first thing I want to unpack with this little discussion is, while I'm not going to make you recount every minute of your time at Eastman, I do want to, I think, I mean, you mentioned three great professors you had an opportunity to work with, Ray Wright, Ray Ricker, and Bill Dobbins. If there is one story that you can share with us that sticks out from your time at Eastman pursuing your master's, I would love to hear it. (laughs) <laughs> well, um, I have to 
say that Ray Wright was, he was a brilliant guy mm. um, in many ways. And he had a really great sense of humor. And this was a, this was many, many years ago. He had us uh, write a big band chart for the jazz arranging class. Mm. And so I wrote a chart on dolphin dance, the Herbie Hancock mm-hmm. tune. And uh, the intro, I had these big um, suspended chords mm-hmm. uh, that the uh, the brass, I think the trombone, bass trombone and bass played the root, and then I had the the brass section spell out this big big chord. And I, I he had me stand in front of the band, and he counted the tune off, and we played the intro. And he stopped, and he looked at me, and he said, "What do you think?" <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm grinning. I'm grinning ear to ear because I thought it sounded fantastic, you know? Oh, no. And so he, he counted it off again. And uh, same thing. He stopped. He looked at me. And what do you think? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't, to this day, I still don't know what was wrong. I know there was something <laughs> really wrong with it. But uh, I talked to a couple of Rangers since then. They said, well, you probably had some parallel fifths or something, you know. But, you know, he, he was one of those guys where he would try to let you figure it out. And I, did not figure, I did not figure it out, but that that was the uh, you know I'm still thinking about it. Oh, that is so too funny. He had a way of really, yeah, that's the way he was. You know. uh, I was I was gonna. I, was I gonna, mean, you uh, you could maybe. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Charles. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I could say maybe you could say well, he should have told you what it was, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's kind of the things that he was so remarkable about so yeah well then you still wouldn't be thinking about it and then you probably wouldn't have learned your lesson if he just told you what it was now that, that, that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have been <laughs> fun at all and then the, the second <laughs> i part, hope the, so yeah and the second part of this that i wanted to unpack is what was it like for you coming back to eastman as a professor after your time there as a student um well, it, it was real. It's really enjoyable, and still is very enjoyable. It's it's an honor to be there. Um, it's got such a great history, and um, you know, it's, it's it's known all over the world as a great place to be. It's got a conservatory atmosphere. Um, the students, for the most part, are very very serious. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I I take it I take the job very seriously and try to as well as I can um, uh, listen to what the students want, try to decipher, you know, their, their fears and, you know, their, mm. their hopes, you know, cause everybody learns differently I'm finding. And uh, you know, you want to be supportive, but yet hard on them to a certain degree. So they get the most out of it because I think what really what you want to show them is not what it is to learn, but I think, you know, how to learn. And so they can continue on their own way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, sometimes a lot of them don't have a good work ethic. So I think that's part of a teacher's job is to really show a, a student you know, how to practice, you know, a lot of them spend hours in the practice room, but maybe not getting as much done as they can to sort of streamline what they're doing and hopefully teach them how to learn so they can do that themselves for the rest of their, you know, and not just music and anything else, Mm -hmm. you know, try to relate it to just being, being, uh, having a sound, uh, having a sound approach to things. Right. And puns notwithstanding. uh, Spin around in circles. Right. And I wanted to yeah, exactly. Exactly. Move, move on to, we want to talk a lot about this. This is an incredibly cool project, this new CD of yours, this new album that's coming out, Electric Miles. And I want to unpack everything with you, but I want to start, I want to make sure we get as many names as possible. This is the e- this is an Eastman show of Extended Harmony, after all. So I just wanted to list all of the some of the Eastman cats that are on here. Uh, the great Michael Davis on trombone, the big show, Jared Schoenig himself on drums. And then we have some more recent Eastman alumni too. Luke Norris, CJ Zarniak, Carl Snabdow all on reeds, Charlie Carr on trumpet, Julian Garview on electric piano. And there are even some current Eastman students as well. Colin Gordon on sax, Abe Nori trombone, Jack Corright on trombone, and Gabe Ramos on trombone as well. So I just wanted to get those names out of the way, give the nod where the nod is due to all those cats. But 
First, Charles, I just want to give you the reins and you tell me about Electric Miles. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, it's um, featuring uh, compositions from um, a number of uh, Miles records. Um, most widely known as Bitches Brew, which mm. is we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of that. Um, so, well, let me, let me first say the other records. Uh, In a Silent Way, um, Jack Johnson, mm-hmm. and oh, geez, there's one more I'm forgetting. Um, but um, primarily it's it's the Bitches Brew recording, which has got so much mystique wrapped around it, you mm. know. Um you know, um, I feel like that music, in a way, is sort of underappreciated still, hmm. even though it's a bitch's brew is one of his still um, best-selling um, albums, other than Kind of Blue. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think it also not only has a mystique around it; it's sort of um, underappreciated. So, um, but I think my generation that kind of grew up with that record always really. Um, just admired what was happening, and you know, if you look at who was on that record, it's basically the the, the folks who started the whole fusion movement. You know, mm-hmm. Joe Zavano, Wayne Shorter, Chick, Herbie Hancock, um, 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 the bass player, um, um, uh, Dave Holland, mm-hmm. um, Michael Henderson, who was who played bass just after that with on Jack Johnson. You know, so um, I don't know. I I just I I I just wanted to put that that music into a large ensemble format. Yeah. And and what you know, as doing it, I learned so much. But um, you know, I, I think what's another thing what's under misunderstood is Tio Macero, who put it all together, of course. But a lot of folks don't realize, I think, that he was a composer himself. Hmm. He knew uh, classical composition techniques. So he um, he took the, you know, it was Miles' um, policy to, when, when they were in the studio, the tape was running, which was very, very expensive back in those days. Right. They recorded everything early on, even in like Miles Smiles and ESP, those records, they recorded everything. But this took the whole editing process to another level, this recording. Mm-hmm. And so T.O. was kind of like the George Martin of the Beatles, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he was not only the, the the sort of the brains behind it, but as was Miles, of course. But, you know, there's more thematic material than you think on those records, you mm-hmm. know, when you really start to listen to them. So appar- apparently Bitches Brew was supposed to be a five, five moment suite, and it got... Um, condensed to what what it is now you know hmm. but of course that's after many many hours of edits and 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 things that weren't used on the recording but you know just delving into that and then i you know i just wanted to codify it and put it in into a format where uh a large ensemble you know sort of the excitement of a large ensemble and basically make it a vehicle for a trumpet m- mainly trumpet soloist and that's uh tim Hagens and clay jenkins Mm-hmm. And of course, Clay is at Eastman, and um, they—I think they did such a fantastic job, sort of uh, evoking the spirit of Miles. You know, mm. um, those two guys just played so great, and uh, it was just such a pleasure to 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 put it together. You know. Yeah, and I want to come back to the, to the arranging side of this. I think this is. Uh, this must have been such a challenge. You, you, you can hear the reverence in your voice, and you're talking about the music and how it was a, how it was put together and how it was produced. So, for you, what was your both your mentality of trying to arrange this music, and what was your process of trying to arrange this iconic material? I'm just trying to figure out what what was important, mm-hmm. you know, thematically. Um, so, so a couple of the tunes are, are simple. Or simpler, um, Pharaoh's Dance was the one that had more thematic material, and even there, you know, the melody doesn't come in. Miles doesn't play the melody until the very end. Mm-hmm. Of course, you don't know whether that was done uh, on purpose or not. But um, and the way he skirts around the melody, you had to, you almost have to listen to it ten, 
20 times to figure out, oh, that's a melody. He's not, you know, <laughs> you really had to kind of dig into that. So, um, so it was kind of just, you know, figuring out what, what's important, what to highlight and of course allow room for a soloist. But, uh, um, I'm not sure if that's answering your question. Or not, yeah, but. no, it does. Thank you. And the other thing I think is uh, interesting about, uh, this album, we'll talk about the, uh, the specifics of recording and, and putting it together. Um, we talked a little bit before we went on. You actually did this in a, in the opposite order of what a band usually does. You recorded it, and then the very next day you played <laughs> you played it at last year's Xerox Rochester International Jazz Festival. The same band, everything. Most bands want to play it live before they go into the recording studio. Any particular reason you did it that way, or you just thought it'd be fun? <laughs> I have no idea why I did that. It just <laughs> it uh it just worked out schedule wise, mm-hmm. I think. You know, um John I gotta say thanks to John Nugent mm. for having us. Um it it was just uh just a lucky uh uh circumstance that uh I happened to contact him and, and we had been talking about it for a couple of years actually having the having a band play this music that i told john about he was very excited about it and i contacted him and i said look i've got i've got these guys from new york coming up we're, we're going to record on this day um i had already booked this recording studio mm-hmm. um or had tentative tentative plans in rochester to do it and he said well okay how, how's this date to play so it just worked out to where the recording was first and the the performances was, was second, which, you know, isn't a bad way to do it. Now that they think about it, mm-hmm. I, I was talking with some other folks about recording music that you haven't fully rehearsed and how, how that can really be a good situation to record. It, ca- it, it catches everyone in their most, uh, alive, mm-hmm. um, you know, emotionally and intellectually, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a little bit afraid, <laughs> you know, but not too afraid. And I think good music comes out of that. So, um, anyway, I, I think it can work either way, but this is the way we did it. And, and, uh, we were very happy that it worked out this, this way. I think everybody in the band had a great time. Um, I think we got a good product too. So yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, very enjoyable. Before we talk about the release of the album, I do want to talk a little bit more about the jazz fest. You are again, playing at this year's Xerox Rochester International Jazz Festival. Can you tell us about that performance? Yes, uh, we're playing on the 20, 24th, mm-hmm. um, June 24th, uh, in the Wilder Room. Uh, it's a trio with myself, Jeff Campbell on bass, and Rich Thompson on drums. It's a group that we call Triosity. Mm-hmm. Um, we released a record last last summer about this time on the... Um, Oh, geez, I'm forgetting the label. Um, we'll add it in post. Um, we'll get it. <laughs> okay. Um, and, um, yeah, it's we mainly play standards. You know, I, most mm. of the records I've done have not been standards. So we kind of wanted to dedicate this band to mainly playing sort of the American songbook. Mm. And uh, it's a trio without any piano. So, uh, you know, the cord- cordless uh, style. Mm-hmm. so uh yeah well, we're looking forward to that oh. it's always fun to play with those guys we all we all teach together so it's fun yeah. to play together well, we're looking forward to that too and w- another thing about the jazz fest i think w- what is so cool about this festival is that because it's so ingratiated into the city people who are who play at the jazz festival are usually fans of the jazz festival too and we're so lucky to have so many musicians in town who are you know members of the community of just the Rochester music community or part of the Eastman community what does it mean to you to play in this giant jazz fest we have here in Rochester oh it's, uh, it's a great it's a great thing for the city and like you said it's um yeah, yeah it's an honor to be there there's so many great great names and, and performances from students to professionals. Um, it's, it's, uh, especially good. I think for Eastman students, they get to play at these venues, these outdoor venues mainly. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's very exciting, very exciting. And, uh, like I said, a great thing for the city. I like the way they've organized it to where 
people can come and go hear half a set and then leave and mm -hmm. then walk, I don't know, 10 minutes to another venue here. You know, I guess the way they've, they've staggered the start times, it's really a, a healthy, healthy way for, for an area of downtown to just get inundated with, with the music and, just the you know, just the hang that that brings. It's great. Absolutely. City. This is my I think my fourth time to play there. So, in the in the eight years that I've been teaching, so it's great. Wow, still feels alive and fresh too. Okay, we want to get you out of here on a couple questions. Uh, to first, it's a big picture thing. Feel free to take your time and answer. Do you have any advice for aspiring artists? Um. Well, number one is practice. It's always, uh, <laughs> that's a good one that's the kind of the and just you know i think uh and whatever that that brings to you i mean you know just the uh, that it's it's always gonna be something you need to work on there will always be something to practice mm -hmm. um and it's a it's a lifestyle yeah i would say being uh, an artist and a musician more than a job it's it's uh, it's not just what you do. It's 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 what you are, who you are. You know, you kind of live music. I'm sorry, live live your life. Uh, you know, really through music. You that's what you're trying to express. You yeah. Know? So I think, um, you know, all the experiences that you have, you can turn them into into music. Whether it's um, I don't know, music that's coming from poetry, mm. or music that's coming from an experience you had or music coming from engineering or music coming from a physical right. feat or something. Any, you know, it can, it can come from, it can have any kind of inspiration. Right. So, um, and if you look at all these, these fantastic recordings that both classical and jazz and, and everything in between, you see that, you know, you see common threads of different inspirations. So, um, I guess advice wise, you know, just, uh, be open to all kinds of musics mm -hmm. that that uh, are are out there and which young people are doing and everybody else is doing as well and always has been but you want to be as i think as versatile mm. um not to be horrible but to be expressive mm -hmm. uh, and to be open to open to different ways of saying the same thing you know? absolutely so, and uh, but, yeah, I think it all boils down to you know, yeah. And to get you out of here on this, uh, we do. When can we buy Electric Miles? When when is it available for purchase and listening? It's available for purchase on June twenty second. Very exciting. And then to end this podcast, we would love to hear something from Electric Miles. You got anything in mind for us? Absolutely. What do you what 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 do you want us to play? Pick a track, any track, or your favorite. I I think Pharaoh's Dance is probably the way, it's the way the original of Miles has opened up. It's a Joe Zavinal tune, and uh, I think that's the way it should go. All right. Sounds good. Charles, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you.